Ken, don't be the person. Thank you very much. Our first presentation is Wolf, aka Mr. Wolf, Mr. Wolf Wolf. No, uh, it's never Wolf Wolf. <laughs> Unless you're a hospital. <laughs> Whatever happens. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, storing objects in Git, or how Git stores all of its lovely objects in there. And uh, I have to say, if you're not familiar with Wolf, uh, he, you can find him in the movie Code Rush. He is the only developer I know of that has a IMDB page, <laughs> <laughs> which is has the wrong name, sadly. I did try to get it changed, but unfortunately, I don't think it took. So, are you the guy that moved from California to Michigan all the time? Yeah. Drove. What's that? Drove. Oh, you drove. Okay. Yeah, that's me. I just watched that this week. That was good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that was that's him. That's him. The guy that slept in his cubicle. That's it. Yeah, and they couldn't find him in the beginning of the show. <laughs> no, no, that's a different guy that they were looking for. Oh, that's a different guy. Okay. Yeah, he was the one that was. He would fix the things that nobody else could fix. That's it. Exactly. All right, now, where is that thing? There's that, and then we yeah, have a bag of tricks. Bag of the <laughs> dongles and adapters. Macintosh folks will be the little dongle. Maybe. Look at that. That is awesome. It just works. <laughs> wow, that is I've never fun. seen an entire room of people get like, oh my goodness. <laughs> it works. Oh, oh, we have more applaud that one. Look how much white space there is at the top. <laughs> <laughs> That's the forehead. Hi, my name's Wolf. It's just Wolf. That should not be confusing. Lots of people have only one name. Probably people in this very room. I know. Uh, I'm one. <laughs> this is uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Do you guys like Jupyter Notebooks? Are you Python fans? Yes. I'm using Python 3.6.3, as should you all. <laughs> Anybody not using 3.6.3? Because you are making a mistake, sir. <laughs> Anybody not using Python? Oh, oh, break my heart. You know, Perl's cool and everything for old search. <laughs> um, so you probably know from using Git that Git makes a directory at the top level of your project called .git. Have you ever looked in there? Have you ever wondered what's in there? Today I'm going to talk about what's in there. There's one, there's two main things in there that are of the most importance, and then through a smattering of questions, we'll discuss the other things that are in there right now. Um, basically, what I expect you to learn out of this is how to reason about objects. Um, maybe objects are mysterious to you now, I don't know. But uh, here's, here's the way it works at its very heart. All source code control systems, no matter who made them, no matter where they came from, conceptually take snapshots in time. That's what they do. They may store different things. Some of them store changes between these snapshots. Some of them store, Git, in fact, stores an exact replica of your file system. So there's an object for each file, an object for each directory, an object for the commit, the snapshot itself. And all of those are compressed and stuffed into a database. Um, other, other source code control systems store big delta files. It turns out Git does have a mechanism for doing this that we'll talk about later. Uh, but what Git does is Git takes each hunk of content. So say you've got a file with the letter A in it. 
it hashes the co the, those contents really with a header on the, on the front of it that says blog. Uh, did somebody raise their hand? Feel free to ask me a question at any time. I may not notice you, and I may I may notice <coughs> you and not call on you, but it may work. Um, it, it'll stick up. A, f a header on the front of that object that is the word blob, a space, the string value that is the length of the blob. For instance, the letter A, probably followed by a new line, is two characters long, so it would be the string two, followed by a null byte, followed by the contents of, the, of that blob. We're actually going to write some code to, to pull them apart and put them together. Uh, it would take that thing. And SHA1 hash that. Do you guys know what hashes are? Because you're gonna. <laughs> uh, and then that hash becomes the key by which you can find that content. That means that Git's object database has a special name. It is a content addressable file system. Wow, this is going to go fast. <laughs> I did not realize how fast this was going to go. It turns out that in this content addressable file system, there are at least four kinds of objects and plenty of room for more. The four kinds of objects are a file, whose header is blob, B-L-O-B, a directory, whose header is tree, T-R-E-E, -E, a commit, whose header is commit, and a tag, whose header is tag. Most of those are just stored as whatever they are, compressed. It turns out that one of those things is not like the other. So a directory is magic. It's full of nulls. It's all compressed. It's got, it's a, it's a binary format. It's not just a straight directory. Um, but let's start with hashes. So a good hash uh, lets you uh, have very different values even for things that start off very similar. Let's look at the, the byte for the character zero. That happens to be decimal 48. And the character one is decimal 49. 48 and 49 are just one byte, one binary digit apart. Just one, one bit. And good hashes, I'm going to import hash live at <coughs> SHA1, both of these right now. Uh, good hashes are very different, mm. even for things that are just one bit apart. You can see, I don't think these guys have one digit in common. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously they have all their digits in common. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but not in the same spot. But not in the same spot. But the C2. C2. Well, there you go. I see that. That's it. Yeah, that's good. Let me make sure. All right. So let's make some objects. I'm in a directory. It happens that my Jupyter notebook is in this same directory that there's my Jupyter notebook right there. And there's nothing else in the directory if I ls minus a. That well, there's IPy checkpoints, uh, but there's no .git directory yet. I'm going to make there be a git directory by calling git init. I'm going to make some text files and a subdirectory d. I'm going to put a text file in that subdirectory. I'm going to add all those files and then commit them. This is all stuff you guys have done before, right? You're all git users. Are any of you git users? Are any of you not git users? Who's not a git user? Fantastic. You guys are lucky. We don't get to use Git where I work. Um, and I'm going to make a tag, too, just, just to really try some fun stuff. So I'm going to execute all this right now. i got to be careful how I scroll. So how many objects do you think that was? There's four. Let me scroll back up to where. There's four text files, A, B, C, and D. There's two tree objects the D directory and the root. There's a commit and there's a tag. That makes eight objects. Let's count objects just to see if we got it right. <laughs> we did. 
Let's see what the head is. The head is 2C99 something. Can you guys read this? Is this all big enough? Mm -hmm. Excellent. <clears throat> I practiced on myself because I'm old. So I'm going to copy this. Notice that I have some numbers already pre-populated. Git has a facility called catfile. Catfile knows several things. One thing it knows is if I say minus T, it will tell me the type of an object ID. So for instance, if I say minus T on that object, it says, oh, that's a commit. If I paste that, it says, oh, that's a tree. If I paste this, it says, oh, that's a blob. So cat file knows the type of things. And let's, minus P says pretty print. Take this thing, this thing, and pretty print it. And what that is, is that is what a commit really looks like. If you look at the raw bits and bytes of a commit, this is what you get. The very first thing is the tree. Okay, this is not your typical commit. This is an initial commit. Because it's missing something that almost all commits have. I'll make another commit later and we'll look. And I'll show you. But what it's missing is it's missing parents. It doesn't have a parent commit. Uh, which a merge commit would have more than one, and a regular commit would have a single parent. But because this is my initial commit, it has no parent at all. But it starts with a tree, that's the root directory that has the A, B, and C dot text files in it, and the D directory. It has the author of the change, which it presumes to be the committer, since I didn't apply a patch that made it be anything different than that. And the committer, and the exact time, and my time zone. And it got my name right. It's like Amazon. Amazon gets my name right. You know who doesn't get my name right? HR. HR does not get my name right. <laughs> I want to say things to HR, but I can't because HR is always listening. <laughs> so, <clears throat> if you see at the very top level of this commit, I have a tree object that starts with 536. Oh, it looks like I already knew that. Damn it. I don't even know what just happened. It looks like I already knew I was going to get 536 out of that. How did I know that? I'll explain in just a little bit. But let's take a look at that top level tree. This is a specially formatted, genned up version of what's in a tree. What it says is, you got three blob objects, a.txt, b.txt, and c.txt, and you've got a subdirectory, type tree, called d, and there's stuff in it. And I can look at any one of these blobs, you can't file, well, why does it keep doing that? You're using multiple fingers. I hate using multiple fingers. Why was I born with 10? <laughs> <laughs> I know, so I can play the saxophone. Do you know how many keys a saxophone has? 23. <laughs> 23 keys. What are you supposed to do with that? I mean, I know because I've played it for a while. But it's daunting at first. Where, where you put your hands on that thing? Yeah, it's got Yeah, that's confusing to me too because you're supposed to play multiple ones at the same time. On a saxophone, at least you do what God wanted you to do and play one note at a time. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's take a look at this object. It is the letter A. So how do these things actually get stored? Let's pull one apart. Um, I'm going to do a couple things. It all comes down to this hunk of code right here. That we get the compressed blob, which we got by reading it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the blob itself is three parts. 
I break it into, into two parts, and then I break one of those two parts into two parts. First, I get the header and the data out by splitting on the null byte. And then I split the header itself into the object type and the length. Up until the, the, that first line, blob equal decompress. All the stuff above that has nothing to do with git, right? That's just that's all boiler. uncompressing a, an object. It has a little bit to do with git. Let me talk about it a little bit. Um, first, I'm persnickety, so I raise a key error if I don't find the thing you're looking for. Um, but really first, zero if I guess you would say, is I look for the object in a special place. Let's look inside. But like the, the decompress, there's, it's not a special git decompress. It's just, it is not a special it's just git a decompress, it's just zlib. Yeah. We're in the .git directory. I'm going to cd into objects. And look what I see. I see six, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven um, directories that have two digit names, two, two character names. Let me just call it tree here. Uh, you can see E2 actually has two different ones in it. But you guys ever use tree? Tree is super useful. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob, is that it? Um, what Git is doing here is this is the object database. It splits the full signature, the full object ID, into two characters and then the remaining, however many there are, 38, I'm not sure, I forget how long this thing is. Uh, two characters and then, let's, let's say it's 38. Um, and puts them into directories that have the name of the first two characters. So the object ID here for this thing in F7 is F70F10E blah, 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 blah. That is what we're looking at. And in fact, if I look higher, you can see F70F101. That is, that is the object that we were just looking at in, in the F7 directory. So what this line does here, this relative path, says it looks in objects and Let's not scroll the whole page. Uh, it looks for the first two characters of the object ID and puts them in between those two slashes. And what, however many digits left that you gave it, minus the first two characters, it puts there. And it uses a star key. It uses the star. The reason it does this is so that I can glob the file name and not path, path, pass every character. So my, I'm super dry, so excuse me when I don't speak like a human being. <laughs> Sound like tickle me Elmo. And, you know, to be fair, look a little bit like him too. <laughs> uh, so, all of this has nothing to do with Git except this little bit of path magic. That says how Git splits object IDs apart and stores object IDs. Everything else, this decompress here, that decompress is just straight out of Zlib. From Zlib, import decompress. That's all it is. And everything after this is just me printing the object, printing the object ID. Let's actually take one. Uh, do we have 16 something? Oops. We don't, that was the tag. Let's print this uh, F7. I mean, I'm going to explode this object. This is a blob. And it says, oh, we didn't, we didn't run the code that defines it. Sorry. Let's try again now. So you can see it's printed the new line, that's why that goes down too, and the length is two because it's A and the new line. Because when I did that echo, echo ends with a new line. So that's printing a blob. Let's print a commit. We had a commit up here. 
see if our if our tool prints commit. You know, let's just take some of the characters since we especially went to the trouble to write it to do that. That's a commit with all the fields of a commit. Let's print a tag. Let's see if we can guess which one of these is a tag. I think it's one of the E2s. So not E217. So how about E20760? E20760. It is a tag. I found it. <laughs> uh, tags have lots of fields in them. Um, this is the object that is being tagged. It's that commit that we made originally. The type of this object that we just referenced is a commit. The tag is named my first commit. I am the tagger, and I made a comment. Not all tags have an object that goes in the object database. Some tags are lightweight, and they just get a reference in the references object references folder. Uh, but because I, when I made this tag message up here and said tag minus m with a message, it said, "Oh, you need an object to have a message, so I'm going to make you a tag object." And that is why this is a full-blooded tag object with all those pieces in it. So. I'm just a tag commit. Can I tag a tree or just tag a tree? You can tag any goddamn thing you want. You can tag another tag if that is what you desire. But you can absolutely tag an object. For instance, you've got one specific version of your config file that you need to go back to and get every single time that you have a change to whatever. You can specifically tag that object file and say, this tag refers to that. And the tags are explicitly set up to understand that you are tagging a blob instead of a commit. All right, so let's look at actually putting one together. This is the reverse process. Do I have the whole thing? Man, there's a lot of white space up there. Look how much look how my screen is taking. That's terrible. So the things that I'm getting from this that matter are hash lib. I need the SHA-1. Does anybody know why we wouldn't want to use SHA-1? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Um, and Zlib, we're going to import compress, which is the opposite of decompress. So this is going to take the data. We'll call it and we would pass in A with a new line or B with a new line or whatever. Um, you see a lot of magic with me doing encode UTF-8. That is because I'm assuming you're going to pass in a hunk of ASCII, and when you want to get the SHA-1 of something, you have to give it a stream of Unicode. So I have to convert this stuff back to Unicode. I kind of waved my hands in the first one and said, uh, oh, it's a Unicode null byte. And the header was already Unicode. Decompressed, it turns out, it gives you back a, a Unicode stream. So I had to decode that. So I didn't mention decode before, but decode and encode are all through my code. This is sort of an artifact of Python 3, which you should all be using. <laughs> so you are all familiar with this, and it needs no explanation that I have already given it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry I've wasted your time. So back, back to the magic. The magic in this one is all expressed in one sentence, that the blob is the object, tag, the object type blob plus a blank space plus the length, which we've already made be a string. It's the length of the underlying data as a string but encoded as UTF-8 so that it can be added together in this blob thing. Then we add on that null byte and then pack in the rest of the data and that is the blob. The object ID is just the SHA-1 of that blob. And this paragraph here 
does exactly what that line I talked about so, for so long in the previous function, splitting the object ID into two pieces. This splits the object ID into two pieces and makes the directory if it has to. And finally, down here at the bottom, uh, it just compresses the blob and writes it in place and then prints the object ID. So let's make a new object. Let's take a look. We got eight objects so far. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight objects so far. We're going to, damn, I hate doing that. Come on. Oh, I didn't think the function exists yet. So now we have a new object, 3F8. 3FA0D. If I do. May I have your attention, please? Will the owner of a blue Honda license plate 3HYZ08 please come to the information desk? The owner of a blue Honda license plate 3HYZ08 please come to the information desk. That count objects is now nine objects. I have a blue Honda, so I had to listen. I was going to say. <laughs> And they're like, and the license plate is, I don't know what my license plate is, but it wasn't that. <laughs> DHF, it starts with DHF. Uh, so there's nine objects. And so now, if we take that new object ID and we copy it, and we take it back to explode object and paste it, we get our new object. Hello world and a new line. Total length 13. That's that's the length. You can count the characters if you want to. But here's the interesting thing. Hello world doesn't actually belong in our database. It's there now. If I say tree, uh, there, there it is, 3FA0D4. Um, but it doesn't belong. So you, you injected a new object into that. I injected a new object into it. So in fact, we can find this, if I, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, if I use git F6 dangling, it will find that object and report it to me as something not reachable from the rest of the object tree. No commit points to that. Why could this be interesting to you? This could be interesting to you if you had just added some changes and then added new changes that were terrible, that you hated, and you wanted to get back to the changes you had just added, but had never committed. It turns out that when you add changes in Git, what you are doing is you are sticking a new object in the database. Right then. That is what you are doing. <coughs> oh, you say add your git add file? When you yes. say git add file, or git add minus i file, and you add just some subsequence of the pieces, you are adding a thing to the object database that is going to be in there for 30 days or 60 days or however long your garbage collection is set for. What is garbage collection? Should I get out of that or should I go back to the add thing? Let me talk a little bit about the index. Let me talk a little bit about SHA1 and whether it's good enough or not. And then I'll talk about the index because I really want to talk about the index. Why does Git use SHA1? First of all, Git does not use SHA1 for security. Git uses HTTPS and SSH for security. It uses the level of trust that you get from using those facilities to do its work, to make sure that the repository you are building has the objects in it that came from the place where you believe they're the right objects. It uses SHA1 just for referential integrity. And I don't mean that in the database way. I mean that in the way of um, all the pieces fit together. You haven't had file damage. 
uh, this is the right thing, it can be fooled. There are known ways to produce collisions that are specifically bad for PDF files. PDF files, you can put as much garbage into them as you want. So you could have a PDF file that's like a renter's agreement that has a low rent on it, and you could sign that, and you could get an SHA-1 of it, and then they could later fake one up that has much higher rent written, and is full of secret garbage inside that you can't see that makes the hash come out to be the same thing. <laughs> it does not use SHA-1 for that, for that purpose. So is SHA-1 good enough? Sort of. People are definitely working on changing out the underlying hash algorithm. SHA-1 is not going to be in GIF forever, is my belief. Linus Torvalds hasn't said that, but they are working on making it be detachable. So here's two different points of views. I'll make this file available afterwards so you guys can get it. But two different points of views are this uh, Y Combinator news item where Linus talks about is SHA-1 good enough and says basically yes it is. And here's Shattered.io saying how horrifying SHA-1 is and how we're all going to die. Yeah. <laughs> and you can weigh those two in your mind and decide which is which. Is which. Alright, now I want to talk about the index. I said there were two major things inside the .git directory that you care about. One of those two things we just looked at is the object database, the content addressable file system. The second thing is the index. The index is also known as the staging area. It's sometimes called the cache. When you do a git add, it's the thing that feels like it's changed. It turns out everything's changed when you do an add, but the index is the, is the first step. Let me look for where the first time I say ls files is. Here we go. This shows what is in the index right now. The index lists every blob that is going to participate in the next commit. Right now, since I've made no changes, it is an exact replica of the head commit, the tip, the tip commit. But let's say I make a change. Right here, I'm going to take, right now, d slash d dot text contains a capital D. I'm going to echo a lowercase d into there, and then I'm going to add it. I'm going to do an ls files minus minus stage, uh, both before and after I add this. So I'm going to run this whole thing right now. And you can see that the index before has that 1.7 number that we looked at. And we did look at that and after has this brand new number 4B, 4B CFE9. If we unpack that, oh look, I already have it because I knew that was what the value was going to be. <laughs> it is D with a new line. Um, it's, it's the whole contents of that file, it's not a diff of the file. It is the whole contents. If it wants to do a diff, it looks at the head commit, figures out what's in that location, and then compares with what's in the index. And it does it using the diff program. It's very sophisticated. When you say diff, you are asking Git to do the biggest thing that it does. All this other stuff is easy. Everything I've shown you so far is, you can write it up as chump change. Diff is hard. Diff compares trees to each other, compares the index to trees, compares the working directory to the index, compares the working directory to the object database, compares two different repositories to each other, compares two different branches to each other, compares one file outside the repository to a file inside the repository. Diff is the bomb. Don't diss on diff. That's my feeling. All right. How many objects do we have? We have nine. I'm just going to prove that one more time by saying, why am I scrolling for? Why am I not just doing it? Here we go. 
So we're at 10 objects now because we needed that D, didn't we? The lowercase D created right. a new we object. We added that D, that made a new thing. I am now going to get GC. Total nine, and now I'm going to get, why don't I just type, what's wrong with me? I have one object floating around. Where did all the other objects go? They went into an object pack. I can cap this pack, but it's not a good idea. I'm going to do it anyway. Those are all my objects. All stuffed together in a way that is like how other source code control systems store their objects with deltas and compression and the works to make everything small. And a path is the way you will get your objects when you sign into a remote repository and ask to fetch the files or pull or whatever. What it'll do is it'll see what objects you need. It'll build a pack of just those objects. It'll ship you the pack and you will either keep the pack or unpack it. Now you can't unpack a pack into your own repo. That doesn't work. But what it can do I will make your foobar cd foobar git init now if I cd dot git slash objects, there's nothing, there's no objects. And I will say git unpack objects taking input from work slash Git storage storage. What what is that other directory called? Git object storage. Git object storage. Not git slash objects slash pack slash. All right, here we go. Ready? This is gonna work. Nine of nine. <laughs> it did work. <laughs> I told you it would work. You doubted me. Who doubted me? <laughs> and now I have all those objects back. So it is possible to take a pack and extract individual objects and move them back into. So this is a way you could fix. Am I, am I, the thing I'm about to say Am I telling you a good thing? <laughs> but what I am saying is, if Save you really, really wanted to, and you had some kind of file damage in your repo, and you weren't willing to just take another repo and reclone it and get everything from crash, you could throw away your pack or throw away the one object and get the pack from the other place and unpack it and pull out just the good object and put that good object into your repo and you could probably do that without writing any code. I would probably write a little code to do it, but you could probably do it without writing any code. And that would fix your corruption. Is it a good idea? Almost certainly not. But now you know how. <laughs> now you know how. So, now I've told you about the pack, the object packs, of which there can be many, and Repack makes more of them, and GC makes more of them, uh, cleans them up and makes, GC makes there be fewer of them if it can. And I've told you about packed objects. This is not to be confused with packed refs. If I go back to
See this file here, packed ref. Packed ref is a different thing. Yeah. Packed ref. Packed ref is a way to take just those 40 digit hex strings and fit them all in one thing. Because originally when Git was written, uh, it was one file per ref, and so you'd have repos with thousands of tags in them, and they would have thousands of individual files, uh, where each file just had one of these strings in it. Is it farming to the Nope. What is, I'm sorry to interrupt, where is Google, uh, Google Meet? Google Meet? It's around the corner, so if you oh, head out that there. way, and it should be down toward the very end of the hall. Sorry, I was not able to help him. Um, so that's what pack rest does. Let me just quickly go over the other things that are in this .git directory because maybe you care. Hooks is where scripts live that run automatically when certain activities happen, like you're about to merge or you just did merge. Info is where um, the real refs live. So ls info cat info slash refs. That's you can see my main branch and the tag and the thing the tag points to. Um, objects we've talked about. Refs is used less and less now. Because mostly you use pack drafts. Um, and the RR cache is, do you guys know what uh, re 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 is? Re 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 is replay, reuse, replayed. What does re 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 stand for? Well, what re 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 does is when you resolve a uh, merge conflict, sometimes you have to resolve the same conflicts over and over and over again because you've rebased a branch and so you keep replaying these same commits over and over again, especially if you keep rebasing that branch again and again against master, say because you're trying to keep up with master as, as your pull request winds its way through the wilds. Re, re re records your resolved resolutions and reuses those. It replays them to help you make your, and that's what the RR caption is. It's for re re re. And that is everything that's in .git, except for some files about commit messages and stuff that are obvious what they are. <sighs> All right. Where did I confuse you most? Any questions? That's what I have. Great.